This is episode 82 with five-time national champion, six-time member of Team USA, medical doctor, the 2016 U.S. Trail Runner of the Year, and co-author of the new book, The Happy Runner, Dr. Megan Roche. Hey everyone, welcome to the Strength Running Podcast and welcome to 2019. I'm your host, Jason Fitzgerald, and I'm also the head coach of Strength Running, where I help runners of every ability achieve their biggest goals. Now, you know, I've been thinking about 2018 and how was such an incredible year for the Strength Running Podcast, thanks to you, our listeners, and also our guests. I couldn't have done it without all of you, so I wanted to start by thanking you so much from the bottom of my heart. Last year, the number of downloads for each episode of the podcast roughly doubled. So thank you so much for sharing this podcast with the runners in your life, for leaving reviews on iTunes, and supporting our sponsors. You're the reason we were able to produce 34 episodes with world-class runners, coaches, strength training experts, dietitians, authors, physical therapists, yogis, and other thought leaders from around the world in the running and health industries. Now, my goal with the podcast is to bring you the best minds in a variety of fields, exercise science, sports psychology, coaching, and nutrition to help you bring your running to the next level. If you have a guest that you'd like me to speak with, you can always shoot me an email at support at strengthrunning.com. I try to make myself accessible so that I can actually respond to your ideas and suggestions, so don't be a stranger. And I'm really looking forward to an excellent 2019, and we're going to get started with a rock star in the running community, Megan Roche. Megan graduated from Duke University with a degree in neuroscience and received her MD from Stanford Medical School. She's the 2016 US ATF Trail Runner of the Year at the Ultra and Sub Ultra Distances. She's a five time national champion, the North American Mountain Running Champion, and a six time member of Team USA. She coaches at swaprunning.com and has recently published a book with her husband, David, also a professional runner, titled The Happy Runner Love the Process, Get Faster, Run Longer. It's a wonderful book that I've had the pleasure of beginning to read. And what we're going to talk about in this episode is how your outlook or your mindset affects your training? Does positivity help you race faster? Does running make people more optimistic? What message is Megan trying to send to runners? I hope that you'll get a lot out of this and have a few new things to think about at the start of the year. Please welcome Megan Roche. Megan, thanks for speaking with me today. Thank you so much for having me on here. It's an honor. We've been a big fan of yours for a long time, so um, it'll be fun to have a chat. Well, yeah, definitely. I've, I've talked to your husband, David, a couple times, and, and I've finally gotten you on the podcast too, which I'm, I'm so excited for. And frankly, you're someone who I'm, I'm honestly a little intimidated to talk to. You're, you're such an amazing runner. Uh, your other accomplishments in life are just incredible too. And uh, I, I hope I do it all justice today with this conversation because I have so many questions about your running, your coaching, and your new book, The Happy Runner. Maybe we can just take a step back and and talk about why you wrote this book and the message that you're trying to send with it. Awesome. So David and I wrote this book and to start the book is not a memoir just because I'm 28 and David's 30 and we have like no idea what the heck we're talking about. So through coaching, we've actually gotten to meet some really amazing people and understand their stories. And during that process, we realized that everyone goes through the same thing, whether it's recreational runners or elite runners, um, kind of the narratives of the stories and the themes of the stories are all very similar. And so we felt like writing a book that connected all those topics was something that was really meaningful to us. Yeah. So can you tell us like some, some high level concepts from your book? Because it's, it's a little bit different than some other running books that are out there. And, um, you know, I, I think the, the underlying theme of the book is, is what makes it so powerful and intriguing to me as a coach, because it's, you know, a perspective on running that we don't often see. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. So <laughs> this is funny. We actually just had a podcast or a, an interview with Outside Magazine. Like, this is the most unique running book we've seen. And I wasn't sure. I was like, is, is that a good thing? But so essentially, the the first part of the book um, kind of talks about the general life philosophy that we see a lot of athletes go through as it relates to running. And then the second part is kind of like 
your more standard training book. So, um, you know, the classic running book. And then, so in the first part, we, we kind of delve into the components of a happy runner. And so we break that down into three things. So the first is understanding your why. So understanding why you're doing this crazy sport in the first place. And for, for, for people, that's like, you know, a lot of people have different answers for that. Um, and we just ask athletes that it, it's, um, it starts with an understanding of the process, which is the second part. Um, and then the third part is um, kindness and enthusiasm. And then to caveat all of that, um, we have a chapter on mental health, just because we found that for athletes experiencing things like depression and anxiety, it's it's impossible to, you know, have an understanding of the first three things. Um, you know, for those athletes, it's like, you know, just putting on your shoes and trying to go out the door for a run is really impossible, let alone, you know, trying to think about happiness and kindness, um, within that framework. Um, and so that was, that was a really fun first part to write. And then, um, the second part was just kind of breaking down, um, a bunch of different training philosophies that we use for our trail athletes. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about that first part right now. And uh, this whole idea of kindness and positivity and optimism and approaching your running through that prism to not only kind of help your life, but also to get more out of your running. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about positivity and, and how it impacts running uh, with less negativity. Do you think you're going to be you tend to be less negative in races? Because I think that is a, a huge uh, important piece of being a strong racer is to take the adversity of racing, to take some of the discomfort of racing and turn it into a positive phenomenon. Maybe thinking that, you know, if it hurts, that means I'm doing something right. I'm getting more out of my body. How do you look at positivity and, and how that impacts your, not just your racing, but maybe your training too? Yeah. So I think there's a few important things there. So I think people who go through mental health issues is often not a choice. So if you think about it as a habit, it's one of those things that if you practice consistently in daily training, it's pretty easy to then transfer it over to racing, you know, which is on that higher scale. And then the other thing in terms of thinking about positivity and enthusiasm is that it's an enduring emotion. So people can have amazing races running on anger or sadness. Um, and that those type of emotions aren't very sustainable. Um, and so that we found that the athletes who last longest in the sport are the ones who are able to take races, to take training and to take a whole positive approach to that. Um, and that becomes really important when you multiply that across a hundred miles, when you know that crap is going to happen, you know, bad things are going to happen. And if you're able to respond to that and know that you're going to respond to that ahead of time with positivity, it makes your life a lot easier. Yeah, I can't imagine when you're 20 hours into a 100 mile race, the the types of demons that might be, you know, in your head, you know, the the devil and the angel on either shoulder. You know, I I want to talk a little bit more about optimism too. A kind of a, a slightly different aspect to kind of this uh this whole positive uh mentality that that I think is is such a central theme of your book. Does running make people more optimistic because I know for me it was almost a survival strategy, you know, and in, in tough workouts and in tough races and high mileage weeks, I almost had to be optimistic to help myself get through it. Is that something that you've found too? Yeah. So I would say that optimism, first of all, it's like running is one of the amazing things that helps feed optimism. For me, it's like I need, in order to be optimistic about my day, to be optimistic about life, I kind of need to get my run in. And so, um, we found that's super important, but I think the thing with thinking about positivity, enthusiasm, and optimism is that they're very So you kind of need to start from a complex place to truly appreciate them. So, um, you, I think that if you understand your place in the universe, like, you know, this is like running is a very small part of what we do. And so if you're able to start from that higher place, then it's easier to think about, you know, these things are important habits, um, and kind of developing that framework over time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you said something really interesting before that, that I just wanted to touch on quickly. And, you know, you mentioned that anger or sadness can be really powerful motivators in a race situation, but they're not necessarily sustainable. And for me, that that just reminds me exactly of motivation. And, you know, if the if motivation hits you, certainly take advantage of it, but it's not really a sustainable type of emotion. You know, it's, you know, I, I'm a much bigger believer in focusing on the process and having a plan and being disciplined rather than relying on motivation. Uh, do, do you see some of those negative emotions as 
helpful sometimes, sometimes, but like motivation, fleeting and not something that you can actually rely on long term? Yeah. So this is actually, this is a funny story. So, um, David, who is my husband, um, we actually went through like a little bit of a rough patch of our relationship. Um, I guess this was like in 2014. Um, and so I was actually going through a spell of overtraining and it just kind of was experiencing all these different emotions that runners go through. Um, and I think for David, it was like, you know, seeing a totally different person in me. Um, and so we had, we had some tension between us. So we actually kind of broke up for 24 hours, but within that 24 hour period, David raised the 10k national championships on the trails and won. And so he beat Bobby Mack in this championship in which, you know, he, at that time he wasn't really predicted to win. And so he was running fueled on anger. Um, he was angry at me. He was mad at me for that breakup and it transformed him. And he still says to this day, it's his best race ever. Um, but shortly after doing that, he kind of had these series of races that he, performed at a subpar level. And it was like, he couldn't transform or he couldn't harness that same, that same emotion of anger. Um, and that was something that was really powerful for both of us as coaches is that in certain, in certain circumstances, you can use anger and it's, it's extremely powerful, but it's always important to kind of center that and ground that and kind of switch back the other direction into more positive and more sustainable emotions. Yeah. Anger seems to me like an emotion that it's it's fine when used in moderation, but if you rely on it long term, it's almost like a weight on your shoulders and it's just going to weigh you down. You know, much like, you know, uh, if you're peaking at the end of a season, there's only a couple races where you can really run at your best before you start to get a little bit burned out, a little bit fried. You start needing recovery. The intensity of your training is too high. I see so many similarities between burning out with intensity and in running, you know, in other words, faster workouts, just too much speed work and relying too much on anger to fuel your training and racing. That's so true. Um, and we see that across athletes all the time. The thing is, it's also, it's often hard to notice that you're slipping into that anger spiral. Um, it's one of those things that can kind of happen. It's like overtraining, you know, it can kind of happen gradually over time to the point where you don't really realize it's happening. And so sometimes it's important to kind of like, you know, get that slap in the face or realize or like take a step back and evaluate things and are like, you know, how, like what kind of life am I leading and how does this make me feel? Now, you've been coaching for a little, a, a long time now, and you're working with recreational runners, you're working with several elite runners. How do you use some of these concepts in your coaching practice? And does it change depending on whether you're working with, you know, a, a, a 25 minute 5,000 meter runner or a 14 minute 5,000 meter running? Are, are these strategies different based on the ability of the runner and, and how they tackle their training? The beautiful thing is that it doesn't. So that's, I think, and that was like kind of a key concept of our book is that, you know, the stories are, are all very similar. You know, people are often facing the same crises of self where they, you know, have a subpar performance and, you know, maybe that, that turns them inward and, you know, makes them upset with themselves. And so, you know, the one thing that I find myself constantly reinforcing in athletes logs is that, you know, you're always enough, no matter what happens, you know, you mess up, you crap your pants in a race, like, you know, you have a bad day, like you are always enough. Um, and I think that 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 conversation becomes opened up. So the way David and I coach is that we um, communicate with athletes daily. And I find it's, it's just really helpful to get to know an athlete. And then that naturally kind of opens up the stories that can lead to talking about these issues and kind of understanding where they are. And people are really open and honest. It's, it's fun, actually. You know, I feel like, you know, I learn so much about people um, through this process. I know. I'm always surprised at how much athletes are often willing to share. And it's beneficial for the coaching relationship. The more you know about the athlete, the more you can tailor their training. But a lot of that is, you know, kind of the mental side of things, you know, how you communicate with the athlete, how you motivate them, how you counsel them after either a disappointing race, maybe they get injured and, and really knowing the athlete, I think is really important. Uh, and, and thank you so much for using the example of, of crapping your pants in a race. <laughs> Uh, I think if you do crap your pants in a race and you're able to come back from that, what can't you come back from? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, it's so funny. An athlete in their log that I mentioned, you know, they had a workout and they actually crapped their pants in the middle of the workout. And I was, you know, I think they thought like they were like, this is the most horrible thing. You know, I can't believe this happened to me. And I'm like, you don't realize like this is pattern recognition. I see this across logs all the time. You know, I maybe see, I probably see that happen like two times a month, you know, it's totally normal. And I, it's actually, it's funny because, you know, I'm both a coach and a runner. And I feel like the stories that I learned from athletes in their logs really helped me as a runner 
runner because it's like, you know, I, I really know from seeing all these examples that I'm not the only person that goes through these things. Right. I mean, I, I used to plan my morning runs right after I graduated college around all the construction sites around town because I had so many tummy troubles that I needed those porta potties. And and I think this might be the first time I'm sharing this very unfortunate story publicly. Uh, so <laughs> I hope I'm not digging myself into a hole here, but that's just part of running, you know, that's just part of the process and you just have to figure out a solution and, and get going with it. And, and part of that is not taking your running so seriously and, and realizing there's so much more to life than running. And, you know, if you crap your pants in a workout, then, you know, that's just life. Let's move on. <laughs> well, I had, I actually had a very similar experience and this is the first time I've ever told this story too. So I was 13 and I was running with my dad. I did a lot of running with my dad as a kid. And as like classic 13 year old behavior, I had, um, Rita's water ice, which is like this Northeast chain of water ice right before I ran and like knew I had to go to the bathroom but like you know at 13 I wasn't used to going in the trees or the woods or whatever and so I crapped my pants right there as a 13 year old like on the trail and my dad was so kind and took off his shirt and was like here go like clean yourself off but it was one of those moments as a 13 year old where I was like wow running is a crazy sport like there's just so many stories that come out of this (laughs) I can't imagine as a 13 year old girl crapping her pants in front of your dad your dad must be a (laughs) Dad of the year. My dad told that story at my wedding, so it came full circle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I used to have a a favorite spot to go to the bathroom on this particular trail loop that we did in college. And my team, you know, the cross country team, they would just know, oh, Jason's not here anymore. He must be behind the wall <laughs> over there in the woods. And, you know, that's just running. Um, I want to touch on, you know, part of this idea that uh, running – isn't the most important thing. And then you have other things going on in your life and, and that's normal. And some of those things are going to take precedent over running. And you said in the past, and I came across this in a previous interview that you've done, but you said that running is meaningless. Can you go into a little bit more detail on that? Yeah. So I think it goes back to kind of what I was saying before about understanding yourself in the broader universe. Like we are so small and compared to everything that's going on in the world that honestly, no one cares about your marathon PR. I mean, maybe for Galen Rupp, maybe for Shalane Flanagan, maybe at like the, the very tippy top, but that's actually, it's really powerful when you think about it that way, because it gives you the opportunity to set yourself up for risks and to take, you know, and to, to embrace failure because no one cares. And that's something, you know, I've tried to explain that to my athletes over time, but then I think on the flip side of that too, it's also okay to care. So even though, you know, we're thinking about ourselves in the context of this broader universe, it's okay to have strong feelings about running because what else matters in the world? Like, you know, if we didn't care about anything, everything would be meaningless. And so it's like this interesting kind of way of phrasing it where things matter, but they don't. Um, and kind of having an understanding of all of that. It kind of reminds me of a saying that I heard a long time ago, and it was, and I'm going to butcher this, but it was something along the lines of, Good distance runners have a very short memory, but they're eternally optimistic. And it just goes to the idea that if you have a bad race or a bad workout or you crap your pants with your dad, you have to have a short memory and just kind of forget about it and move on. But you're always optimistic about what the future might hold, about your potential, your progress, what that race three months from now, you know, how how that might go. And to me, that's it's just such a powerful way of approaching your running, because, you know, if there's a failure, it's not really a failure. It's just a learning opportunity. You learn from it. You move on and you keep going, because I think, you know, it this reminds me of entrepreneurialism and business. And you can't not fail in, in any important endeavor. That's so true. And I think the other thing about failure too is, is that the best, funniest stories come from failure. So for me as a 13 year old, that like tragic run where I crapped my pants, that was like a major failure. But you know, I wouldn't have that story here today if that didn't happen. And the same thing goes with racing. Like I think back to some of my favorite racing memories um, and some of them come from the worst races just because the funniest stories, you know, come from that. But, you know, I think of course that takes you know, once you cross the finish line of a, a bad race, it definitely takes a couple of days or a couple of weeks to be able to develop that comedy. I think there's there's a saying that comedy is tragedy plus time. And so I think that time element is really important for runners. Do you have a particularly tragic race or workout experience that was maybe devastating at the moment or or something that you were just so negative about? But now that it's in the past, you kind of look back on with some humor? 
Yeah. So David and I were racing in Italy as part of Team USA. And it's funny, I was like actually just thinking in my head. The funny thing is, is I don't even remember what the race was, but it was some like world mountain running championships or world long distance championships. And so it was a 50K course. And um, I just had a horrible day. Um, I just, I was coming off a crazy med school experience and was working night shifts and then traveling over to Europe was, was kind of a disaster. And so I was bringing up the rear of a race in a race that I was kind of expected to be not on the podium, but maybe in the top 10. And so was having a tough day and kind of, you know, it was, it was tough. Um, and so I come up to the final aid station, I crest a hill around like mile 26 and there is David sitting there at the aid station. You know, for me, I was like, I expected him to be finished hours before me. Um, and he was planning to drop off, drop out of the race because he was struggling with tragic cramps. And so I was like, you are not dropping out. We're doing this together. And so I pulled him up and then we finished the race together and we both finished hours and many hundreds places behind, you know, our expectations, but we had never finished a race together. And so being able to share that experience and like eating chocolate croissants on the race, which was, or on the race course, which is something we had never done before. That was, that was really meaningful to both of us. Yeah, that's funny how a race that was such a disappointment, you you did not perform how you wanted to perform, how others expected you to perform, which I think is is, is another challenging aspect to deal with. And you, it ended up being this great opportunity for you to finish a race with your husband and, and at the same time in Italy. I mean, that to me is, is a memory that you're going to have forever. And it was born out of a horrible race. Yeah. Well, it's, I think, you know, that was great because there was like this amazing story out of it. We got talk of croissants, but like, you know, a lot of failures don't often have endings quite like that. Another one I can think of is that, um, I raced the X Terra half marathon trail championships this year. Um, and I came in third and it wasn't for me, it just like, wasn't a fantastic performance. Um, and looking back on it, there wasn't some beautiful moment during the race, but it was the fact that I was okay with it. And, you know, I still had an amazing race vacation as we like to call it. And, um, being in that mindset for me was such a win and it kind of turned the so-called race failure into an overall success. This reminds me of, uh, one of the worst races I've ever run in my entire life was 5,000 meters on the track. I was a freshman in college and, my coach is is on the side of the track asking me, Jason, do you want me to pull you from the race? Because I was just running so slow. It was embarrassingly slow. Before the race, one of my friends who was a senior, he was very good. He told me, hey, Jason, I'm going to lap you by mile two. You know, kind of joking around, <laughs> a little bit good natured ribbing before the race. And I'm joking around. You're never going to touch me. He passed me two meters before the two mile mark in that 5K. And, and when my coach asked me if I if I wanted to be pulled out of the race. I said, no coach, I just can't race any faster. And I finished that race. It was over a minute faster than my high school PR, which at the time was, was, was not even very fast. And I had gotten a lot better during that season. And it was just this, this feeling of how could this happen? How could I disappoint my coach? How my, my whole team was kind of cheering me on, but in a really sad way. <laughs> but it was one of those things where now that I look at it in hindsight, that was one of the things that lit a fire under me to come back the next season. And I had an amazing season. I finally made the varsity team after my freshman year. And I look back on it. And I just think to myself, if you never have any bad races, if you never have any opportunities to struggle, then I don't think you're going to have as many opportunities to grow. And that's one of the wonderful parts about running is that you have an almost endless number of opportunities to potentially grow from. That's so true. And I think the other thing too is, is that without going through the tough experiences or the failures, you can never truly appreciate the great moments too. So you kind of, you need to experience the whole existence of a runner's life to actually be able to get the full highs. Like, you know, if you never go through the true, lo true lows, you're never going to experience the true highs. And so I think it's really important to understand that and understand it as it's happening too. Sometimes, I mean, I've, I've been actually struggling with an injury recently and I'm like, well, you know, those the next few months of when I do come back running, I'm going to appreciate it so darn much. And yeah, I think that's a really helpful thing to understand. Yeah, absolutely. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk a, more about some of the training side of things that are included in your book. And, you know, part of that is, is your advice to runners to love the process. And, you know, I was kind of silently pumping my fist in the air reading this part of your book because, <laughs> you know, the process is something that I'm always advocating, but 
I do sometimes have difficulty explaining what the process is and how runners can fall in love with it. What is the process? So I think overall, the process is like the entirety of a running life. So I mean, it's even the parts where you're not running. So like when you're foam rolling or stretching or going to bed early because you've got to run the next day. And it's appreciating all of those little moments. And I think, you know, a lot of times and in social media these days, you can think that runners are always having these glorious training moments, like every workout's amazing. But for me, the definition of a process is Tuesday morning when, you know, maybe I took a rest day on Monday and Tuesday feels sluggish. And I'm out there just grinding away and appreciating the magic and the mundane. And I think that's like something that's really important is just appreciating all the little moments, even the ones that feel trivial. How do you do that? Because I think that's one of the most difficult parts of being a runner is appreciating the mundane. You know, it's that five, 10 mile run. It's just a base run. There's really nothing to get excited about, but you kind of have to do it anyway. How do you fall in love with just going through the motions of training because sometimes that's what you have to do. Well, for me, I'm I'm sure this is kind of blasphemy to some people, but I love music. So for me, if I can like crank up Taylor Swift or like something good, um, that really helps me get going or a podcast. Um, But I think also giving yourself the space to know that you don't have to enjoy every run is really important. So, um, you know, there's magic in the mundane, but there's not always magic in the mundane. And I think that's like giving yourself that the room to have that is, is important. Um, and it's just like noticing little things. So for me, I actually like running with a camera. So, you know, I stop and take a picture of of something beautiful, maybe on an easy run. And I think that being able to perceive beauty as I run has been something that's been really helpful for me. I think it's very helpful and instructive to hear someone of your caliber of an athlete talk about stopping in a run to take pictures talk about, you know, having bad races to talk about crapping your pants. We're going to come back to that like eight more times in our chat today, Megan. Um, and, and really just talking about all the the lows and, and the ways that you don't necessarily take your running so, so seriously, because that just, it, I think it gives permission to us recreational runners to, to take a step back, to take a breath and not to put so much pressure on ourselves. So uh, I appreciate you, you know, kind of being a little bit more vulnerable about those moments because they really help us recreational runners. That means a lot. Well, it's funny. I think I've gotten, so, you know, I, I do take a number of pictures on my run and I've gotten it down to be so fast. So I can take like 15 pictures in a run and have like 90 seconds of stoppage time on Strava. So it's all about like having that home screen ready and like be able to flash. But for me too, I think it's also, I think in running, there's a sense of like, you know, I know my place in the, like, you know, I'm, I'm a decent trail runner, but I'm never going to be Shalane Flanagan. And, um, even Shalane Flanagan is like, well, can I always be Shalane Flanagan? And so there's always that element of like, you know, just understanding where you are in the broader scheme of things. I'm like, I should just enjoy the heck out of this. Yeah. Yeah. If you're not enjoying it, then, then why are you doing it? And why do it? Yeah. I mean, I'm not good enough to justify, you know, not enjoying something and continuing to do it, especially because of how much time it takes. And, you know, I'm always telling runners, I'm not in the business of of getting you to love running. If if you love running and, you know, you want to put in the work, that's amazing. But I think trying to pigeonhole yourself in, into this position of, you know, I have to love every single part of running. That is another way of putting just so much pressure on yourself to to be something that is almost impossible to be. That's so true. And I think you spoke a really important part about, you know, as a coach, not being able to, you know, convince your athletes to love running. You know, I think that a lot of times that has to come from within. So like as coaches, we can give tools to help athletes think about that from, you know, creating a framework from within to enable the love of running, but it's nothing, you know, it's funny, no matter how much positivity I give in a log or, you know, the amount of support, it ultimately has to come from that athlete. And I think it's an important thing to accept both as an athlete and a coach. Yeah. Now, there's another chapter title in your book that got me pumping my fist, and I wasn't able to read this chapter, but it was learn how to run fast before you practice running hard. And and I think there's so much nuance and shades of gray within this chapter title that I think is fascinating and so interesting. Can you go into this idea a little bit more? Yeah. So to start off with like a large caveat on training in general is that everyone has, you know, everyone is different. So something that might work for one person is different for another. And I feel like that's always important for training philosophies and different things work for different people. So for me as a coach, 
I feel like it's largely pattern recognition. So the, you know, the more athletes I see, the more I can tailor training, but in general, um, a principle that we found, and this is more specific for trail running, but it also works for the roads is that, um, athletes who focus on doing high intensity, um, aerobic work or high intensity lactate threshold before building their speed often start to lose the, the, um, kind of the max power that enables them to hold those efforts. Um, so one example for me is, is that I came to running as a field hockey player. And so I had, I was very fast just because field hockey is a power and strength sport. And, um, so I was able to kind of work out at, more like at more lact- that lactate threshold do kind of like some extended hour stuff but that was because I had this space of speed but then you know I kind of extended that over time and kept doing longer and longer efforts but I kept getting farther and farther away from my speed and so as coaches we continuously reinforce speed throughout the year so things like power hill strides or like four by 30 seconds hill strides um, or eight by 30 seconds and so really easy things just to keep that speed going all year round yeah, it reminds me of of a really great kind of saying that I heard about training a while back that I always seem to come back to, which is you should never get too far away from any one aspect of training, whether that's, you know, you, you focusing on aerobic workouts or doing really consistent long runs or, you know, doing these kinds of speed workouts or even racing, you know, as as runners, we have to kind of change our focus throughout the year. And I think that's what periodization really uh, entails. But at the same time, just because you're focusing on one thing doesn't necessarily mean that you're ignoring, you know, speed work or your long runs or whatever it might be. There's always the balance, but the balance sometimes skews more heavily toward one type of workout more than another. That's so true. And I find that athletes often enjoy that more too, just because, you know, your workout structure is continuously mixing up. You're not doing the same thing every week, you know, every day looks a little bit different. And so I think, I think it's, you know, when you're enjoying things, you're probably going to benefit and adapt to that better anyways. And so, um, I think that's a big component in that there too. Yeah. Another big, uh, check mark in the column for being a happy runner and, and trying <laughs> to be more optimistic about your training. If you're doing varied training, then you're going to be uh, more likely to be happy. And I think happy runners are just more engaged with their training. They're going to get more out of it. They're going to be more productive during workouts and races. That's so true. I want to talk a little bit about your medical degree. You're, you're, you're an elite runner. You're a doctor. Um, sorry, Megan, I probably should be calling you Dr. Roche. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, is it, is it helpful to have an MD uh, as both a runner and a coach? And, and I guess my follow-up is how have you used your medical training to be a better runner and a better coach? Sure. So I'll start with the runner. So it was very tough to run and be in medical school at the same time. So Get out I have things of like running at like one third mile loops, um, at 3am on a track. Um, and I would like drag David there to have like a support system because it wasn't super safe at 3am. But so that was really tough and something that I I probably wouldn't do again. Um, but I think in terms of, um, being an ultra runner, it actually made me really comfortable with discomfort because I was doing a lot of runs at weird time of days. I'd been standing on my feet and going out for runs. And so for an ultra runner, I actually felt like that was an advantage for me. Um, then of course, you know, I wasn't recovering as well. So there's like a whole bunch of other things there, but as a coach, I actually find it really useful. I think, um, and you probably see this all the time in coaching too, is that a lot of coaching is balancing medical issues issues, whether that's colds or flus or amenorrhea, or even I've trained a lot of athletes through pregnancy. So balancing those issues as well as injuries with training. And so I feel like I kind of, you know, kind of take a primary care approach to viewing a runner. And I think that's been really helpful for some people. Yeah. Um, you know, you talking about how difficult it was for you to train while in medical school, uh, I think first and foremost is, is it kind of a, an obvious, an obvious <laughs> thing. Uh, I, I'm just amazed that you tried to keep up with your running in medical school. I have some friends who've, who've gone to med, med school and I can't imagine on top of the schedule that they were trying to do to go out and try to do this kind of training. But the idea of doing your runs at all different times of day and running kind of in the middle of the night and running one third mile loops over and over again, I can't help but think that this trained you to be anti-fragile, to thrive in these moments of uncertainty, to kind of have this mentality of I need to get it done no matter what. And, and, you know, as a coach, I look at this whole situation and I think, you know, maybe first and foremost, I hope you're getting enough sleep, but, and then second, (laughs) 
you know, this is really building all kinds of mental fitness tools, you know, all kinds of mental toughness tools. And uh, can you talk a little bit more about how that that experience helped you develop some some mental toughness? Yeah, so there there was a lot of mental toughness and a lot of tears, honestly, during that time. Like, you know, I, I I joke about it, but it was actually it was really challenging. And you know, I think I'm so lucky because David was just like an amazing support partner during that time. But understanding that I was doing this and kind of I think what for me where the mental toughness came from was knowing that I was doing something that was crazy and giving myself the opportunity to fail as a result of that. So I would sign up for races and be like, you know, holy crap, this is a 50 K and I've been training at 3 AM and haven't been doing as much mileage, but it's okay. You know, I'm still doing the best I can do. And I think in some sense, my mental toughness came from knowing that it was crazy. If that, if that makes any sense to you. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of just the the outlook I take during many situations with my athletes where we're just going to take a do the best you can mentality. Yes, there are extenuating circumstances. Maybe the weather is really terrible on race day. Maybe you're coming off an injury and your training wasn't uh, the best or as good as it could have been, but that's okay. And we're just going to do the best that we can. And I, I think this is another great example of you just kind of putting yourself in the position to Try to get as much out of your running as you can with the understanding that, you know, you're in medical school, you're working a lot, you're probably not getting as much sleep, and you're not going to be racing as well. You know, it's to me, it's like you are you go to race up at altitude, you're going to race slower, and there's no way around that. You know, it's like trying to run a race when it's 90 degrees and 95% humidity. You're just going to race slower. And, and being able to be flexible with those types of scenarios, I think is so critical because it's that flexibility that allows you to stay positive when you don't have a good race because you understand all those factors that went into making that race a little bit more subpar than, than it might have, could have been. It's such an interesting psychology there. So um, I was coaching a lot of athletes for CIM this year, and many of the athletes that I was coaching lived in the Bay Area. And um, unfortunately, the Bay Area was impacted by the campfire, which was the smoke that was coming in from, from Northern California. So, you know, I kind of it and like, you know, we're still going to do this race. It's going to be awesome. But just understand that, you know, we're not going in in like the most ideal circumstances. And I had five athletes and that and all of them PR. And I think that like kind of removing the pressure from themselves and understanding that they were going in, you know, as mentally tough athletes and having gone through something very difficult was helpful for them too. Right, right. It kind of makes me think that, uh, you know, just by removing the pressure and understanding those extenuating circumstances, it's just such a great way to uh, put yourself in a good position to enjoy running a little bit more. And, and I think for most of us too, we have to understand that, you know, we're, we're not being paid by Nike. <laughs> we're not being, we don't have a sponsorship. We probably don't have a coach. We're running for ourselves. And if we finish a marathon in, you know, 342 instead of 338, it's really not a big deal. And at the end of the day, I think what matters is, did we enjoy our training? Was the race a great experience for us? And have we grown from it? And at the end of the day, I think that's what's most important. And the funny thing too is, is I feel like, and um, this might be not true at that the, like much higher level than I'm at, but I feel like for a lot of the shoe companies and sponsor deals, they only care about stories too. So like Hoka, you know, it's like if an athlete comes back and rallies from injury or, you know, athlete gets over pregnancy, it's like, you know, they find those stories so valuable for their overall brand that they don't necessarily like put that external pressure on athletes to always be winning races. It's like, you know, they just want, you know, to develop their brand in an interesting and unique way. That's fascinating because even even the big shoe companies understand that, you know, it's the the person, the the growth that they experience, that's what sport is really all about. And it's not necessarily whether you come in first or a hundred and first or if you run a PR and get on the podium or not. It's it's that it's that growth and it's that kind of personal side of things. And I think that's the most powerful aspect of running. Which applies to business too, which is like super interesting because I think, you know, shoe companies come at it from a business standpoint too. So it's kind of an interesting intersection of like business and running and, you know, training and all, and all of that. So for me, it's fascinating to see how that works and, you know, how agents work and the whole process. <laughs> Absolutely. Megan, this was really fun for me. I, I kind of love your, your whole perspective on, on training, on racing, and I can't wait to actually finish your book. I admittedly wasn't able to before we spoke today, but, uh, if, if folks want to pick up your book, is it safe to assume that it's available wherever books are sold? 
So right now it is available on Amazon. We've learned a lot about the mysteries of Amazon and how like distribution and inventory work. So right now it's actually only available on Amazon. So it's sold out of like Barnes Noble, Target and many bookstores. Um, but we'll have a second printing soon. And that means that um, other areas like local bookstores, Barnes Noble and Target will have it in addition to Amazon. Okay. So we'll check out Amazon first. And um, where can runners connect with you online somewhere? So um, my husband, David, and I, we have a coaching group, Some Work, I'll Play. Um, and then our website for that is Swap Running. And there's um, a Contact Us tab there. And you can ask us literally anything. So like if you have questions about crapping your pants or like, you know, training questions or medical questions or whatever, um, you can send them, uh, send us send questions our way there. Great. Well, I'll link that up underneath uh, the podcast on the blog. And I'm glad that you kind of tied tied up the whole interview with a reference to crapping your pants again. Uh, <laughs> that might be the entire title of this podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I really it's been so fun to talk with you today. Well, thank you, Megan. I appreciate it. And there we have it, my conversation with Megan Roche. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you thought we talked about crap in your pants too little, please let me know so I can devote an entire episode to that very topic. Now, you might be thinking right now that happier runners are more productive runners. And I would agree with you. What makes me really happy is knowing things, especially about my running and my health. And that's why I'm proud to partner with Inside Tracker to sponsor this episode. Inside Tracker helps you identify imbalances, physiological weaknesses, or even overtraining syndrome by evaluating over 40 different biomarkers in your blood, things like stress hormones. And, you know, I was personally tested with the Ultimate Package last year, and I loved the entire process. I loved how easy it was, I loved the results that I got, and I really loved how the recommendations that Inside Tracker gave me were so effective. And, and that's what I really like about this company. They help you remedy any imbalances in your results. So they don't just tell you what's wrong, but how to fix it. You can check out the details of all their different tests at insidetracker.com, what the test covers, how you can use it to your advantage, and the roster of high-level runners taking advantage of this very unique service to peek under the hood and see what's going on inside their bodies. Now, of course, don't forget to use code STRENGTHRUNNING at checkout. Why? Well, it'll save you 10% on any test, no matter which one you choose. The code is STRENGTHRUNNING. There's no space in between there. It'll get you 10% off any test. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening. Happy New Year, and I look forward to hanging out with you again very soon. Bye.